Hey everyone, Kyle from Andrew Hilton here, and we've got another beer tasting coming up for you, July the 14th at 6 o'clock. Now, we're going to be bringing to you Omnipolo. No. Kind of a Canadian beer, but not really. Omnipolo is a brewing concern that skips from country to country, brewery to brewery. Um, they go all over the world. They've been to Spain, they've been through all Western Europe, they've been to North America, they've been to Asia, and they always do just slightly different beers everywhere they go, including in Canada at Toronto's Brunswick Beer Works. Uh, first off, we have Zodiac, which is their Swedish New England IPA. Not sure how a Swedish New England India Pale Ale really fits together, but that's, uh, that's something we'll get to. Uh, next up we have Omnipolo's Bianchi. This is their Mango Lassi Goza. Uh, I love mango sour beers. I actually quite like Mango Lassi. Um, I'll be really, really curious to see how this comes out. If it was anyone else except Omnipolo making this, I'd have some questions, but these, these folks are famous enough. They rated one of the top 10 breweries in the world. They, it should be fine. And then finally, we have one of their foundational beers, uh, and that is their Oat Pale Ale, uh, a beer that I really do actually know I've had in the past. This one's actually very, very good. I can't wait to taste that. So this is a brewery lineup on its own, but they only have three beers in Alberta. So what are we going to do for a fourth? Uh, we're going to get to our old friends at Driftwood, who have a brand new beer this week. Uh, this is their Brett Saison. So they got a little bit of, you know, raw wheat, a little bit of barley malt, and then they're using Britannomyces yeast to kind of give it a little bit of funkiness and earth and richness. So a bit of a different lineup this week. I had to do on Apollo. They're just, they're too famous not to, and we finally have three options to do, and they fit in our budget. So this is what we got coming for you folks. All that and more, Wednesday, July the 14th, six o'clock. Can't wait to see you out. <laughs>
kind of thinking person's brew. Uh, Eric chimes in with the very first question that wasn't, you know, related to our complete lack of audio for the first 30 seconds, Aaron. Um, or the stain on my shirt, so that's good. Um, they brew this same recipe in Toronto, or they only brew this recipe in Toronto? Different questions. So Zodiac was very first brewed for Omnipolo in Toronto. This is still brewed in Toronto, but it's now pr also brewed at De Proof in Belgium. Uh, Maz, on the other hand, was very first brewed at De Proof for the Canadian market by Omnipolo. It's brewed at one of their partners. If you had Zodiac, if you had it in Europe, uh, say you went to the Kirka or the church in Sweden, um, you might get Zodiac brewed at their own uh, in-house brew house at the Kirka. You might get it brewed in Canada. You might get it brewed at De Proof. But in this case, it was first brewed in Canada. For all the others, they are brewed in Canada, but they were originally brewed elsewhere. Uh, so let's jump right into the mass. So oat pale ale, obviously on the hazy side, and you know, coming from a 2012 adapted in 2014 recipe, you know, this is this is early early days. So the uh, the hazy IPA movement, hazy pale movement, like this is before at least for Alberta, like blind man New England pale. So early days. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I, c I can see why these guys are fairly famous. This is, um, this is pretty spot on. Aaron, how's yours? You're having something completely clear off the growler station. Get yeah, you'll, yeah get I'll, I'll get there. You'll get there. <laughs> He's still drinking his fixing the audio beer. Um, and yeah, that juicy but pine. So I would say this is very classically like a first wave New England IPA or New England pale because, yeah, they were kind of just figuring out the style. And this hasn't gone into the land of, you know, Rickard's White, just juicy citrus and sweetness and, you know, possibly some hop character beyond the citrus, like some New England IPAs I could name. This still has that classic West Coast bite, and it still has that lifted, tropical, juicy New England character. I like that I get a little of both. Would I call this a New England? Not necessarily. It's certainly hazy. I might lump this into my, you know, self-named No Coast IPA in the sense that it gives me a little bit of both, and I like that for it. Yeah, Sean comes in with exactly what I was just saying, a little bit of everything. It's a little bit of east, a little bit of west. It's just a nice pale ale. Um, and I also really like the art. I like that it's just this, this melting candle. I also love that it's a collaboration between a brewmaster and an artist who designs all of their cans. Um, it's a little bit different than, say, collective arts, where you know every year they release three new or four new cans for their core beers, and they're always like a rotating art exhibit. With this, you know, the art doesn't generally change. It's almost always by the same artist. Some of the collaboration brews, um, they do some open clubs with other breweries. Um, those will be done with slightly different packaging, but it's always the same artist, which is incredible. And yes, let us pour out a thimble of beer and play the world's smallest violin for those poor, you know, bureaucrats who have to label this a product of Canada. And it is. It's brewed in Canada. It's packaged in Canada. Um, and here, it, it's, it's an entirely Canadian product. Is it the brainchild of a Canadian brewery? No, but it's made in association with a Canadian brewery. I'd say that this is a Canadian beer in a vastly more uh, Canadian way than, say, you know, Copper Moon or Jackson Triggs. I don't know why I'm air quoting those. Those are the actual brand names, but those as Canadian wines. There we go. We got it right the second time. Uh, those as having, you know, 100% Canadian wine because they don't. They have a, a legally designated, I think it's 15% Canadian juice, and the rest can be juiced from anywhere as long as it's fermented and packaged and bottled in Canada. So, no, uh, I do think it's a very Canadian beer in the sense that it's all made here. I would also wager to say that, you know, if we went to Toronto, grabbed a six pack of fresh Maz cans, put it on an airplane, flew straight to Belgium, got a six pack of fresh cans from De Proof, where this is also probably brewed, um, which is definitely brewed, uh, they, would, it would, they would taste slightly different from each other, just out of style. So it is a Canadian version. Um, kind of reminds me of how um, Guinness works in international markets. So Guinness Irish Stout, the classic one that we buy in the four-pack tall cans that are 500 mLs instead of 473s, the one that you've had every St. Patrick's Day. 
That is brewed as a beer concentrate and shipped all around the world, uh, reconstituted with water and becomes Guinness, but it's all the same stuff. Doesn't matter where you are in the world. But Guinness for an extra stout, um, that's a different recipe depending on the country. So there's a version for Canada, which you may or may not have ever had. It's not very good. It's brewed by Labatt's. It's god awful. Um, but there's a version that's brewed in Belgium, and it's brewed by Belgian breweries. I actually think it might be brewed at De Proof. Um, and it's fantastic. There's a Caribbean version that's great. Uh, there's one that's brewed, I think it's brewed in Thailand, but it also might be brewed in Indonesia for the Southeast Asian market. Uh, there's one brewed in South Africa. There's, there's varying versions of Guinness for an extra step brewed all over the world, and they're all slightly different takes on Guinness. It's this is a dry Irish stout plus the local markets, you know, differentiation of what makes their market. So I think that's very interesting. But yeah, uh, Omnipolo Mass. It, it's a very damp bus, Eric. The, uh, the bus trip from Toronto to Belgium is, um, you're going to drown. I, I mean, you know, that's why it's a one-way ticket. Oh yeah, Daughter Creative would actually be really fun. Ooh, here's a great question from Chris. How much industry cred do you need to start brewing your recipes at another brewery? And would they oversee things at the brewery and or send the... Okay, so two questions there. How much industry cred do you need? Um, if you want it to be like an honor and something they're just going to hype up and it's going to be like this big collaboration and look, we got selected by Omnipolo, aren't we great? You need to be pretty damn famous. I'd say that like the number of breweries out there that can do that would be like Omnipolo, McKellar, Evil Twin, maybe one or two more that aren't coming immediately to mind, but like those are the big three. The other side of that coin would be contract brewing, where it's like, hi, I'd like to make beers from my really terrible homebrew recipes. We're not interested. Here's $15,000. When would you like your can, sir? Uh, to a certain point, a lot of breweries will do what's called a contract brew. It's not that complicated. It's not that difficult. Assuming the brewery, you know, isn't absolutely too slammed to do it. Like, good luck booking a contract brew at Cabin right now when they can't keep Supersat in stock. But generally speaking, like, if you show up cash in hand and say, this is my dream, uh, they will either take your homebrew recipe or far more commonly, they'll say, what would you like this beer you want us to make for you to taste like? So this is where we end up with, like, uh, President's Choice Ultimate Dry, uh, which is brewed by Labatt's. They basically went to Labatt's and said, we think that dry beer is the future wasn't but you know they thought it was so they actually contract brewed a beer to their specifications um earls has their albino rhino series uh original joe's has their oj's uh brand uh browns has their own house captive brand for beers it's not uncommon at all to actually have contract brews done to have it be like a look what we're doing aren't we amazing these people sure um and then collaborations are a whole other thing you could be the tiniest brewery in the world but if you've got a lot of hype behind you and the other people over there either are your friends or they think you're cool or they want to help you out, you can do a collab anytime. But generally speaking, you either got to be stupid famous or you got to bring with a big, you know, comical cloth sack with a dollar sign on it. Like that's, that's kind of how it goes either way. Uh, the other question was, do they just send over the recipe and instructions? Really interesting. Um, here in Alberta, there's a, uh, a brewery uh, just north of Calgary, whose name is escaping me. I wanted to say Common Crown, but it's not actually Common Crown. Uh, it's Field and Forge, pardon me. I uh, knew it was two letters back to back that were the same. Uh, Field and Forge is a lot of contract brewing or that sort of thing for breweries. Yes, if you just give them the recipe, they will give it to their brewmasters, they will brew it for you. You don't even have to be on site. Most breweries that I know that brew at Field and Forge because they don't have the capacity, they're too busy. Uh, I know Cabin has done some brewing at Field and Forge in the past. They basically just rent the equipment. Their brewmaster goes over, they take their hops that they've purchased, they basically just rent the space for the afternoon uh, and they brew there. So it's a big squishy middle ground of what's a custom brew, what's a collaboration, what's a contract brew. Uh, I would say this is somewhere between a collab and a contract because Omnipolo definitely 
almost definitely doesn't come over and supervise every brew of this, but I don't know for that for absolute fact, so they might. I don't think they would, especially with COVID, but they might. In this case, I'd say this is like a really good brewing partnership, closer to a collab than anything else. Um... Yeah, the CanCon regs and music are really interesting. Um, for, for the liquor industry, it's a tax reason. Uh, Canadian wines are taxed uh, at a lower bracket than anything else. That's the reason that Jackson Triggs and Copper Moon and Peller Estates and name five other ones exactly the same. Uh, they are naked grape. They're always the cheapest wines on the shelf. Doesn't matter if, you know, Chile has vastly cheaper labor. The grapes can be had basically for free but there's a tariff coming from Chile or coming from the United States or coming from Spain or France where the wines are just going to hit the shelf a little more expensive. What if you took that cheap juice from wherever else in the world you're sourcing it, bring it to Canada, ferment it here, just sneak through the regs enough that you can call it a Canadian wine and pay no tariffs, then you end up with these Canadian wines. So, yeah. Proof the Labatt's hates us. I don't think Labatt's hates us. They're just really, really terrified of how much they can't compete in the craft beer space. And I will say I have noticed a wonderful, wonderful trend that I'm very in favor of, that when a big brewery buys a small craft brewery, everybody basically just says, ew, no, never buying that again. Um, which makes it really, really hard for them to just buy up the craft industry and do well with it, which has happened in the past. Uh, like when Sleeman's just drove a dump truck full of money up to the Shaftesbury's people's houses and said, here, walk away. Shaftesbury's ours now. I like the fact that, you know, when Labatt bought Banded Peak, Banded Peak suddenly was like deeply uncool. Uh, and even we took them off our shelves, not because, you know, we didn't like the beer or anything, but just like they stopped selling. Like we went from selling a flat, flat and a half a week each of Mount Crushmore and Microburst to just not selling any. It was overnight. Um, I'm kind of proud of customers for, for picking that up and saying, you know what? No, this is, Labatt, you don't need to be here. Like, keep making Kokanee and Blue and whatever 10,000 new flavors of Bud Light you're going to come out with this year. That's, that's your space. Leave us this. This is something that's ours. I, I really respect that that hasn't worked by and large. Mm -hmm. Small business and small brewing. Kevin could maybe keep Superset in stock if they didn't release a new recipe every week. Probably could, but they'd be less fun. Um, Wayne Gretzky IPA, no comment. Not just because I'm wearing a Wayne Gretzky wine t-shirt, um, but you know, <laughs> that, that, that might just be it. Um, and there is an absolutely huge amount of trust in a contract brewer, which is why a lot of breweries, Field & Forge is an exception because Field & Forge does still make their own beers and are very successful with them. Uh, but there's literally a, uh, a brewery in Vancouver, uh, and there's something like they're really open about, like, they're called factory brewing, um, and they just do nothing but contract. They don't make any of their own beers. You can't buy factory IPA. You can't buy factory pale ale or Hefeweizen. It doesn't exist. They have none of their own brands. But if you are uh, a brewery in the United States or Eastern Canada and you want to distribute in Vancouver, and you want to pay like Canadian tax rates, don't want to deal with the refrigeration and the shipping and the border and the COVID and the everything. You just want to get your beer into customers' hands in Vancouver or in Western Canada in general. You can come up to the, their brewery, hang out with them, teach them how to brew your beer, spend a week, 10 days with them, like working through all your recipes, and then go home and come back like once a year to like do quality assurance and check up on them and make sure that they're, uh, they're meeting your needs. Like that's a huge part of the business is that uh, uh, contract brewing because opening a brand new brew house is expensive as anything. And if, you know, say Cabin really wanted to be in Eastern Canada and, I don't know, Steam Whistle had just expanded their brewery and had a whole bunch of, you know, brand new fermenting tanks sitting empty, okay, would you guys be interested in brewing Supersat three days a week? And we'll come out and do quality assurance to make sure it meets our standards, but it's still Cabin's Recipes. It's still our people like going out there and checking up on it. We taught you how to brew it. Is that all that different from being brewed at Field & Forge? Not convinced. I mean, yes, you could argue water profiles and D D D D D. yes. Um, 
But I don't know. I, I think there's a place for some of that contract brewing, especially since, you know, what's the carbon cost of, you know, only brewing a beer in San Diego, California? Spoiler for next week. And, you know, that's your only location on Earth. And people in Japan and Europe and Canada want this specific beer. What's the cost of brewing it in San Diego and shipping it everywhere in the world versus just brewing this exact same recipe locally and adjusting the water uh, through proper water management to actually just match San Diego water's profile? It, I don't know. It's a complex question, but I really don't have an issue with contract brewing, especially when we're talking about different continents or different sides of a very large continent. Did I get a little cheese with that Wayne Gretzky wine shirt? Uh, no, I, I did get like six shirts though, so uh, I will uh, I will definitely take it. Has Labatt's really lost that much of the market share? Um, big answer would be yes, but not like recently. Um, let's and I won't just say Labatt's. Let's say macro brewers in general. Um, Labatt's and Molson's by the early two thousands had basically bought up or put out of business everyone else. Six was gone, uh, O'Keefe's didn't exist, Carling Brewing was already folded into Molson's, um, whatever the heck the name of the brewery is that makes Alexander Keese was basically gone by that point, absorbed into Labatt's. The Columbia Brewery that made Kokanee was absorbed into Labatt's. They were two breweries with like 98% of the market. And then having 98% of the market, it started to get nibbled at at both ends. On one end, we had the Minhas folks, the Mountain Crest folks, the we can all do the buck of beer, Rob Ford, Doug Ford, stupid buck of beer nonsense. We're just gonna make cheap beer, and that's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna make beer so cheap that it's almost uneconomical, but we're gonna find a way through volume to scrape out a little bit of a profit. And they started, you know, customers quite wisely realized, wow. This really cheap lager tastes exactly like much more expensive lagers like Blue or Canadian or Kokanee or Bud. We're just gonna buy that because we buy in volume. So their very, very large volume customers switched to the value brands. And at the other end of the market, the craft beer end of the market, well, that was even worse. You know, maybe these people down here who still really liked an American style lager, maybe when they, you know, grew up a little bit and got out of college and started making a little bit more, maybe they'd want to buy Kokanee. Maybe, you know, on payday or when they were feeling a little spendy, they'd buy it. At least the bars didn't buy these discount brands and they would, you know, they'd drink them in the bars. Once you get to this other end, this craft beer end, which is something they really didn't know anything about, now you've got craft beer customers who, once they get into talking about Omnipolo and the difference between contract versus collab versus any of the others, um, they're not coming back, guys. Like. You can make all the Rickards White and Blue Moon and Belgian Moon and really terrible Alexander Keys that you want. Um, they're not coming back. They're never going to be back, you know, drinking Budweiser as their everyday beer. They're, they're gone. Um, and that's scary for these folks. They went from having 98% of the market to, okay, our store is a huge outlier considering I think we have like four listings on our shelves that are like American lagers. Um, but I'd say they've gone from like 100% of the market to 70%-ish. Um, now, if you went to somewhere smaller, if you went to say northern Alberta, um, to like a, a coal and gas town, sure, it'd be 95% uh, Molson Labatt's again, absolutely. But the broader markets, especially urban markets, cities, uh, and especially in places like Vancouver uh, and in Calgary. Calgary's got a ripping good beer scene now. If 50, 55 percent of the market down from 98 percent, that's terrifying for them. Now, a couple things have changed. Um, one, spirits have been in a pretty steep decline and beer has been in growth for the last few years. So the beer market as a whole has grown. Uh, and the other part is uh, beer companies finally are just barely getting their heads around how to actually like get women into beer and to market to women and to make beer that you know women want to drink that isn't like immensely tied up in this bizarre image of masculinity. Um, so suddenly they realize that hey slightly more than 50% of the population are women. I wonder if they'd like to drink beer. So they've also tapped into a different market but that's very much on the craft side and not so much in the domestic lager side. So 
they haven't seen the big shrinkage that you would think. Their market share as a percentage is way down, but beer as a category is up, and women coming into the beer category is a relatively new phenomenon uh, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, although they are pretty much exclusively going over to the craft side. That was a really long-winded answer, and we are 25 minutes into this damn thing. We are still on beer one. So, wow. Um, yeah, I... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Eric did it again. No, I did it again. This is on me. Broke him. Yeah, you broke me. You did it. So now that everyone themselves is already on beer three, let's go to beer two. That's the Zodiac IPA. Uh, first brewed in 2014 uh, at Brunswick Beer Works in Toronto. Uh, now also brewed at the Proof. That was a wretched pour. I'm so sorry, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah, just, just leave my shame up there. Please do. Just so I can be consistently humiliated by it. Um, yeah, so this is Zodiac spelled with a K. Uh, that's fun. I also really like the fact that they actually went for the black top. I mean, it's clearly just painted on there because the edge is silver, but I kind of like this like all black can. You don't, you don't very often see anybody do anything with the top, even with the pull ring. That's, that's fun. That's probably the first time I've ever seen somebody actually go to that extent to get this all black can look. Thanks for being still on uh, beer two, Sean. I hope you poured yours better than that. Um, so this is a Swedish Canadian India pale ale. Uh, sorry, it's a Swedish Canadian New England India pale ale. So we get Western North America in Canada, Eastern North America in the United States, Scandinavia and India all in the same sentence for saying this beer's, you know, name. I kind of dig this. This is pretty. Um, No, uh, these have not been available to us since 2014. Um, these have only been in the market a short while. Uh, I actually just filled out a uh, pre-purchase agreement to bring in a whole bunch more Omnipolo. Um, I don't know the details on this, so do forgive me. Uh, this is kind of how it was explained to me by Devin and Nigel, who had a closer eye on the Omnipolo situation. Omnipolo was in, with a different agent who was charging like more wholesale than we charge retail for these. They switched to a new agent. The price dropped almost in half. Uh, so we're now, you know, taking our standard markup on these, and it's still way cheaper than we used to have to buy it for. So that's why Omnipolo suddenly fits A, on our shelves, and B, in the beer tasting. Um, can I give you more details than that? No, because I kind of got it secondhand, but that's broadly how it was explained to me. I kind of got told by Devin on a very busy Monday that we were doing Omnipolo because I was losing my mind with a whole bunch of last minute restaurant orders. He's like, no, I just, I got this. You're doing Omnipolo. Shut up. Don't worry about it. So thank you, Devin. Okay. So Zodiac, uh, the very first of the Omnipolo beers first created in Canada, although I'm told there have been some since, uh, still brewed at Brunswick Beer Work. Done as a New England IPA coming out in 2014, so four years after their founding, uh, a year before Blind Men New England Pale for us. Now, this of course came out in 2012 and was drastically changed in 2014. That's right on Omnipolo's website. There's nothing about that with Zodiac, and I will say this about Omnipolo if you go to the website and you look up any of their beers, they do kind of give you a pretty good synopsis of what they did to the beer post-release, where it was first created, when it came out, what they did with it. Really appreciate that. Makes my job a lot easier. But uh, yeah, they didn't talk about changing this, so I'm going to treat this as though it's exactly as how it was at release. I can give the can a twirl. Wow. It's almost like they all already have a can at home to look at for themselves. And have been staring at it while I went on these weird tangents for the first 25 minutes with the first beer. Um, you know, I'll say, very often, now this is 5.6, this is 6.2. I would have treated this like their IPA until I had the Zodiac. This is just, this is a very technical term, very Moorish. It's got a lot more going on than the Maz. It's bigger, richer. It definitely has a little more alcohol. It definitely has a little more bitterness. This feels like an IPA to me. Whereas, you know, the Maz did, first beer of the night, but 
this just, it's bigger yet, and I really like it for that. And yeah, yeah, it, it's a happy sort of beer. I really like this. These, uh, we only brought in a flat of each to test um, because I was slightly worried considering how this whole agency change thing happened that maybe they'd be not as fresh as I wanted. Uh, but we'll be bringing all of these back, or at least the first two. I haven't had the third one yet. Um, no, that's, that's really fun. I absolutely adore that as an IPA. That's exactly what I want. And yeah, they are that, that classic no coast. I get the pine, and then I get that incredible softness that makes it very sessionable, very easy to drink. And it's really hard to call that a no coast, considering it was first brewed in 2014, which is, you know, five years before we even started talking about Midwest or no coast IPAs. But maybe it was just they got it really, really right at the very start of the New England IPA or New England Pale movement. And then since then, we've, you know, softened it up perhaps a little too much or sweetened it up perhaps a little too much. Quite like that. Yeah, I'm a huge, huge fan of this. This is probably my first, my favorite new IPA in a little while. I'm trying to think that it, what else has been like. I really liked Cloud Juice. Or food for clouds. I think I like this more. I was part of the people who really liked Great Outdoors because that was a divisive beer here. Um, Great Outdoors. I think we're now sold out, or if we're not, we have one four pack left. Uh, that was the new super limited batch from '88, uh, and it was a IPA with spruce tips. The people who were like old school, way back IPA drinkers, like myself and George and Nigel, were really into it. Everyone else was like, "No, way too piney." Just terrible. Let, this is awful, uh, which was very interesting. The Butter Coast. I can see pineapple. I'd also see, like, dried ginger with this uh, to a surprising extent. Pineapple, lemon lime. Yeah, almost like roasted pineapple or cooked pineapple. Hmm. Yeah, I really like that. That's wonderful. And a surprise, you know, I, I'm very cynical when it comes to these things. I looked at this as like, oh, the packaging's so flash. It has to be bad, right? I don't know. I, when somebody spends this much time and effort on the packaging, I worry that the beer inside has had half as much time and energy put into it. But this is great. Did they actually tell you the hopping on this? I don't think they do. No. Uh, do you have those images, by the way, up for me? We we did actually prepare a visual presentation for I you. Showed the dudes already. You showed um, the dudes, yeah, uh, Henuk and Carl. And then I uh, went and now we can't get I it back. To open, mom... Oh. Again, we could just everybody. Audio is fine. Okay, so. Um, Rather than put our poor audio upload and Aaron's infinitely janky laptop through such strenuous exercises that I would point out the desktop wouldn't have struggled with for a second. Um, when I said that Omnipolo didn't have a brew house, they do now. Uh, I did a bit of looking around. Getting the date nailed down was a little tricky. It seems like it was about 2014, 2015. They bought a church. Not like a small church, like a fairly large church in Stockholm. Uh, and, you know, right down the center of the aisle, it's, it's all filled with fermenters. It looks like they maybe still have an organ at one end. Uh, and it's all done up with, like, beer labels and this giant smiley face over the altar, or what used to be the altar. Um, and it's just this brewery in a church, and it looks amazing. Uh, and that's actually what the originating brew house for the Bianca. It does look cool. Just a shame the laptop won't let us see it. Also, you actually have like a, a, a head tan. You have a forehead tan with like the strap of your ball cap. Yeah, you have, you have a stripe. Summer. Summer. <laughs> I have glove tan for my cycling gloves, so I can't really say anything. White hand. Like dark finger. Well, you can see the line. And it's even worse on my knees oh, from my cycling shorts. Yeah, like right here. No, it's not a full finger glove. It, it does cut off here, but for some reason that doesn't translate. Yeah. Yeah, they are really, really neat guys. And most of these, like, we're just starting out with recipes and we're going to, like, 
spend five thousand dollars to get them brewed once and hopefully we make our money back and then they start building a brand and building a brand and they still don't want a brew house they're just like these are our recipes these are this is our art we're literally funding one i mean it kind of sounds like a ponzi scheme but it's not we're funding the next brew by selling the first one and we're just we're building this one layer at a time that's how these folks started they basically started with like five thousand dollars and like some cool homebrew recipes uh, and they just built from there. Like they could fund one batch of beer and it sold. Uh, and then they went on from there. So yeah, there, there are really like rags to riches story. I, I really like this brewery. I'm, I'm glad that we can actually show them off now that the prices come down a bit. Um, on the shelf, I think I charged like eighteen ninety five for a four pack, but I think we'll sell them as singles probably. All right, let's roll on to Bianca now that we are, bloody hell, 35 minutes into this thing. We're, we're on to our third beer. Um, yeah, I was laughing with Aaron. I was like, ah, these beer tastings, they always run short. We'll be done in 45 minutes. No, we won't. <laughs> Corporate rant. Well, it got very ranty. You know. If anyone from Labatt's is watching and has immediately cut off our beer buying uh, abilities, I'm very sorry. Uh, okay, one... God damn, the color on this is great. It's exactly the color of mangoes. And for a mango lassi goza or mango lassi sour, that's great. Oh, and they sm it smells like mangoes too. And I get that creamy character. Mango lassi is, is a dessert. It's quite a sweet dessert. Um, and it's basically mangoes and cream. Um, I really like how this smells. Uh, I was rather nervous. Yeah, we brought them in because Omnipolo, and I was like, oh, there's a pale ale and an IPA, and oh, it's a mango lassi goza. Oh, that's either going to be great or terrible. It's great, and I'm glad it's great, because otherwise we're going to have, like, an all-the-things moment. Because this could only go two ways. Oh, shit. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's exactly what I wanted tonight. Well, that's... Yeah, that's... It's even thick in a creamy. weird way. Yeah, it's thick and it's creamy and it's soft and the mangoes are right there. I will be super sad if Labatt's cuts me off because we sell a lot of draft for, uh, to our bars and restaurants through Labatt's. <laughs> yeah, it's got a real sour cream yogurt thing. Uh, it's got the mangoes like right on top. Not, not green mangoes or whatever the hell those are, but you know, like fresh, ripe yeah, mangoes yeah. like that. Spectacular. Yeah, I'm here for this all That's day. Crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, these guys for a brewery we've never even talked about on the channel before. Um, like, I was aware of Omnipolo. I did not know we could get them. Um, man, like, I think that's, that's, like, when we turn off camera here, I'm going to the office and I'm ordering, like, five flats of this because holy hell, that's wow. good. Yeah, that Bianca... Yeah, that's, um, I, I don't really need to explain it. I'm just going to enjoy it. I'm going to answer some questions. Just drink this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have quite a few flavors of Bianca. Um, I don't remember all of them, but yeah, it seems like Bianca is their code for, like, this is a flavored Goza, yeah. and they have a whole bunch of different flavors. Uh, I think this is the only one that's in our market. We were offered another one. I want to say it was a pumpkin spice latte, Bianca, that was going to be an October release for Halloween, everybody. Um, which I would normally make fun of really hard, but if this is like that, yeah. I'll drink their pumpkin spice latte. I might even like taste it on the chat. I think I only ordered one flat, but Two still. Oh, there's so many pumpkin beers. I could just throw in the dumpster and then set the dumpster on fire and then shoot the dumpster into space. No, pumpkin spice beers are just an aberration upon this world. Um, yeah, Heather, you are definitely the odd one out because uh, I'm pretty on board with this. If anybody else is not on board, I'd really love to know why. Um,
Yeah, it's yeah, it's you know what? There's um, there's that Medicine Hat Bruco. They have that creamsicle beer. Yeah. And it genuinely tastes like a creamsicle. I think it also tastes like a creamsicle, but like an adult creamsicle. Sure. Like it, it tastes like you know a chef said, "Oh, we're we're gonna deconstruct a hot dog." And da 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 da. Exactly, also, yeah. speaking of hot dogs, for another tangent, did you were you on Reddit today? <laughs> Why? <laughs> the the epoxy hot dog, the the infinite Reddit fascination of the epoxy hot dog. Okay, sure. Are you familiar with this? No. So no. somebody uh, somebody took a hot dog, put it in a bun, ketchup yeah. and mustard. Yeah. Uh, and then they just sealed it in a box of epoxy. Oh, I love this. Yes, so and, and they've had it yes. like spinning on yeah. this on this turntable, I okay. believe on a line cam all this time. Uh, today was its ninth, uh, nine-month birthday. Nine-month birthday. So, Hallelujah. and it looks exactly the same as it what did when it went in the epoxy. Celebrate. Yeah, what a time to celebrate. I will say, though, in a great piece of design, they put a little party hat on it, on the block of epoxy. Yeah. They'd also sealed the little party hat in a block of epoxy. I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> And all these things, like, got a hole in the thing, other thing, off of it, put it in, I don't know, I love this trend, I don't know what it is. Yeah, it, it's you know? fun, though. Yeah, it's, it's And we just lost half our viewers because we went on that <laughs> tangent. <laughs> About cured meat and cured epoxy. Eric's having some mouthfeel issues. Um, I will say... It's a bit sweet, isn't it? Like the more I drink this, like this is supposed to be a sour. I'm not getting a whole lot of sour. Now it is a dessert sour. It's openly supposed to be like replicating a dessert. I'm not really sure I get a lot of sour on this. And yes, Eric, this rant is not your fault. Not your fault at all. So, time for Shameless Promotion Corner. And we now have enough YouTube videos for me to tell you that this tasting is presented to you by Skillshare. No, it isn't. That's stupid. <laughs> uh, but I'm really sick of those ads. Every single goddamn YouTube channel I follow when they get enough followers, this is now Skillshare. Uh, sorry. Anyway, on to Alesmith. Um, exactly. Like the, <sighs> Skillshare is the really bad one. Um, anyway, so we are going to be talking about some beers next week as well. And we're going to be talking about Alesmith. Now, Alesmith is one of those breweries that I absolutely love that was a foundational, like, changed me sort of brewery. Uh, their Alesmith Speedway Stout uh, is one of the most incredible beers I've ever had in my life. It is in Alberta, but unfortunately it's draft only, and you don't even want to know I'd have to charge for a growler or that. It'd be like $45, so we're not doing it. But... I love Alesmith. I absolutely adore Alesmith. They're from San Diego. They've been around forever. Their classic West Coast IPA is, I think, one of my top 10 IPAs I've ever had, or at least historically it was. Absolutely love it. They've got a hazy one as well, and they've got their hazy 394, which is a tribute to some baseball player named um, Tony Gwynn. I don't really follow baseball. Um, you know. Yeah, I'm sure he was great. Uh, but yeah, they've got three IPAs, West Coast, East Coast, and then this Hazy 394. This is a passion thing for me because I saw these beers. I was like, yep, doesn't matter what it costs. We're doing Alesmith. We have to. I love this brewery. Uh, and then because it's just a pure passion thing for me, uh, and for those of you who watch our wine tastings, you know I'm just a huge Riesling nut. This is Two Crows Riesling Lager. Um, I mean... It's lager with Riesling Piquette. I, I just have to, because we can talk about, like, Piquettes as a style. We can talk about lagers. Tell me Riesling. This is just going to be a fun one. This is all about me's beer tasting. All right. So uh, for wine tasting, we are taking some weeks off. Uh, it is summer. Uh, we have noticed our wine tasting numbers do take a bit of a dip in the summer. Uh, so you're going to hear me talk about this wine tasting for, like, three more episodes before we get to it. But, you know, it's summer. You're going to have to forgive me for this one. It's still better than listening to another damn Skillshare ad. Uh, so this is a little bit of a different one. We are doing it with uh, Lanigan Edwards Wine Merchants. We are going to do a red because we have to do a red because if we don't do a red, nobody buys the damn tasting. Uh, we're going to do a white, two rosés, and a red. White and one of the rosés are from Bordeaux. Uh, Chateau Renon, 
Sauvignon Blanc with a little bit of Semillon. The Rosé de Chevalier, this is from Pesac Leonien, which is actually my favorite uh, of the left bank regions. Uh, this is a wine that I'm really excited to pour for you. I think it's so fascinating. But I wanted to contrast it because when most people hear French rosé, they think Provence rosé. So we got to do a Provence rosé just to talk about it, just to show it off. I really want to show the Shadow de l'Escorel. This is a really lovely Provence rosé. When I tasted it, I actually, he said, well, what do you think this costs? And I guess about six bucks a bottle more than it actually is. It's good, cheap Provence rosé, which 10 years ago was very easy to find. Now it's a lot less so. And then finally, we're going to finish with the Tuscan red. There aren't a lot of regions in the world where I want to actually drink, you know, red wine in summer. Beaujolais, cold would be one. Some natural stuff in California, cold would be another. But I still have some time for Tuscan Reds in summer. So tasting pack is 85 bucks. We'll be doing that July 30th. So a little over two weeks from now. May I have the fourth beer there, Aaron? Thank you. When can we do a beer tasting in person? You know, I actually talked about that with the folks from Annex about my crazy beer tour thing that I like, call oh, you have no idea how busy we are. I'm like, yeah, but we've done so much. It's a work in progress. <laughs> I, I basically got told to shut up and go away and not so many words at most breweries. But doing something like this in person with like a live audience, wow, that would be intimidating. But wow, I really want hecklers. So, oh, yeah. um, Aaron and I will have to have a really interesting conversation about that fairly yeah, we soon because like an we we like, yeah, an applause sign, yeah. hecklers. Pe we could uh, like give people tomatoes to throw, and I'd wear a white shirt. It'd yeah, be great. Absolutely. So good. But their viewership would hit because they all be here. Exactly, the viewership numbers would just. <laughs> nosedive because everybody be here but that'd be fine too as we've always said as long as people are buying the kits we can't really pay too much attention uh to the viewership numbers because at the end of the day the viewership numbers don't pay the bills yeah, yeah. um interesting point by dear that you think it would be better if we had it first i based this and again we we had some issues and such beforehand um Hence the staining on the shirt where I had to go lift a keg. Um, I should have tasted these in advance. Had I tasted these, this, like, in order. Um, had I tasted the Bianca with these before, I probably would have put it first. I usually slide sours down to the end, just because they usually will even destroy IPAs. That's on me. We kind of got stacked up towards the end. Uh, it was a busy day. I had a lot to do, so no. You're right, the Bianca probably should have opened. That's on me. Uh, is there a way to arrange a beer tour in Cali that would avoid the knobs that arrive on the party bikes? Yes, there is, and I'm working on that, I promise. Okay, so let's finish up with a new, new brewery for this tasting, but a very old brewery by and large. This is Driftwood. Uh, Driftwood, of course, the makers of Fat Tug and Naughty Hildegard, and we did a whole tasting around them, I don't know, two months ago or so? Yeah. But this is a reasonably be new beer for us, reasonably new beer for them. Uh, first brew in 2020. I don't think we saw it in Alberta in 2020, so this is the first time to market. This is a Britannomyces-infused Saison, or in short Brett Saison. Uh, this is a style popularized by Boulevard Brewing, uh, who did their Saison Brett, which they did in these big champagne bottles for years and years and years. They were designed to be very age-worthy. Did they age? Eh, Jerry's still out on that one. I, I bought a case of Saison Brett way back in the day. It did not age. Or at least it aged, it just didn't improve. It got really plasticky. Uh, these folks obviously uh, are not encouraging you to age anything because the cans are cheap and plentiful and they come in a 473 mils can that you can just pick up off the shelf and, you know, crush on your next fishing trip. They're wonderful. Uh, Britannomyces, of course, being a wild yeast, it eats the sugars that Saccharomyces leaves behind. So it creates a very tart, very earthy, very in interesting beer. And the longer that this can sits around, 
place at room temperature because if you have it very cold, the, the Britannomyces can't do its work. It will just change. It'll continue to become more tart, more earthy, more leathery, more cider apple-y, uh, and it will just continually evolve. But as it is, the Britannomyces is adding some tartness, some leather, some cider apple, some horse blanket, some kind of sweaty notes that I can smell right out of the glass, even talking like six inches away. I can smell it. Oh, and let's just dive right in. I love this. <laughs> keep the till open so you can keep the glass. Four hour event that no one drives home from. Four hour event that the AGLC shuts down in week three because it's like the most toxic thing ever. I'm on board. Let's do it. Um, right? Like, oh. okay, we just talked about how cool Omnipolar is. This is just the folks who make Fat Tug, and they killed it this hard. Right? Yeah, I love this. Okay, but I've been around horses a little bit. You know, my ex-wife really liked horses. I didn't. They're very bitey, and that's why I stay away from them. Um, the horse is not my ex-wife. Um, but still... Uh, <laughs> I'm better that too uh but really um i i get that like horse sweat character that uh, Aaron, Aaron needs a moment uh, <laughs> uh but no i get this like horse sweat stink to it that i i find very distinct to that aroma being around horses um that i really enjoy i i love how like sweaty and rich and spicy and salty this is it has a wonderful character to it i i like this style Yeah, it's, it's got that finer bubbles to it. I it's coarser. You think it's coarser? It's coarser. I disagree. I think it's actually slightly yeah. finer. Huh? Fun thing. Okay, I have some ratings coming in. Uh, Lorene has three, four, two, one. John has, oh wow, we have some really different ratings here. We have, well, we have all three as number one, and I'm with you on that one. Um, but the rest are just a mixed bag, like 421, 124, 2414. They're all different. I mean, everybody liked the Mangalassi, but everything else is different. Uh, Craig says 4123, and I'm completely wrong. Nobody's wrong. It's a fun lineup. Um, we presented rarer, crazier, weirder lineups, sure, but this is a fun week. There's a lot to like here. And more than that, the conversation, I mean, okay, this is going to go down as one of my favorite beer tastings of 2021, and it's all on you. The questions have been incredible and kind of led me into some weird tangents and weird jokes, and you know what? Once I get going, you can't stop me. So when you get the tangents going early, it, it tends to become a very good beer tasting. Yeah, yeah, I'm a wind-up grouch. I'm a as, as my new business cards by Eric say, I'm a curmudgeon about town. Ooh, Terry says one, two, four, three. You know, I love how divisive this Bianca is. Like the first group had it universally number one, uh, and then Chad and Terry both have it dead last. Uh, I really like that. Uh, Chris has it first. Heather has it last. Oh, I, I love how many people love slash hate the Bianca. Absolutely mm. love that. No, I don't... Has anybody had... I, I want to check this. Has anyone had Bianca anything except first or last? First, 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 last, 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 last. No, it is literally either first or last. There is no in-between. It's Ricky Bobby. <laughs> if you're not first, you're last. <laughs> Did one get overwhelmed? Um, perhaps. But, I mean, there's a reason we started with it. If we'd put it in the middle, it would have tasted like nothing. So, yes, it was the lightest beer. We only had three options from Omnipolo. I literally couldn't have picked something else. Did it get overwhelmed? Sure. That's why we did it first. I mean... It's a cool-ass beer. I'd buy it myself. But yeah, I mean, with things like Bianca and Viewfield, and yeah, 
Maybe it's the wrong tasting with Maz. I'd love to see Maz against, say, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale and that, and Cabin's Retro Spectrum, and uh, maybe like Annex Good Authority. I think it'd be a really fun lineup where it would perhaps win the lineup. But against like a super hoppy IPA, and then a sweeter sour, and then a breaded Saison, it's the wrong lineup for Maz, but I'm glad we did it first. I think it showed very well for the. 35 minutes we tasted it or whatever yeah. it was. The whole thing's the dog. And yeah, Tyler, I agree. This is one of my favorite tastings since the very start, which is hilarious because I came into this with just an absolute foul mood about the whole thing. I, was, I had a very bad day by and large, but you know what? I came in and I was like, God damn it, we're going to do this beer tasting. We're going to do it right, and we're going to get through it, and then I can go home. Uh, and no, it ended up being really good, so I'm all on board for this. Thank you very much, Aaron. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you to all of you. This was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, next week we'll, uh, we'll chat some Alesmith and Riesling Piquette Lagers. I can't wow. wait. See you then. Good night. <laughs>